Can I put this here? Is that yep. all right? Yep. Okay. Good morning. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are on the unceded territory of the Algonquin people, and I'd like to say welcome. My name is Charlie Beresford. I'm Executive Director of the Columbia Institute, and here with me today are Karen Farbridge, who is our top S lead author, and Andrea Reimer, who is a member of our advisory and a Vancouver City Councillor. A few words about Columbia Institute before we move to today's re release of our 2017 federal report card on ramping up low carbon communities for climate action. Columbia Institute is a think tank focused on inclusive, sustainable communities. Our research streams include public finance, local economy, green economy, and this won't surprise you, governance. Here's a brief slide picture at some of our public finance research reports. Today's report card is an initiative of Columbia Institute's Center for Civic Governance, where we look at the long, large, large issues of the day through a government policy lens, local government policy lens. Last June, we published Top Asks for Climate Action, Ramping Up Low Carbon Communities. Today, we are reporting out on the specific policies detailed in the report for leveraging up local government action. Why? Because local government decisions impact over 50% of Canada's greenhouse gas emissions, and our cities here are home to at least 60% of energy consumption. Canada cannot take effective action on climate without ramping up low-carbon communities. The scope that, lo that local government leadership offers has both Im immense potential and represents absolute necessity. Even if every single signatory to the Paris Agreement implemented its current greenhouse gas reduction targets, and that includes the United States, we are on track for three degrees of warming. This week, Christina Figueres, a former chief of the UNFCCC, said, and I think this is a good quote, this is no time to waver. She was tabling a report called Deadline 2020, which calls for the decarbonization of infrastructure by 2050. While the Paris Agreement commits us to well under two degrees, and this is a widely used number, it also commits signatories to work towards 1.5 degrees of warming. There is not a consensus that two degrees is in fact safe. We are already seeing impacts in Canada, floods literally here in Canada in our backyard yard here just uh, a few days ago. Forest fires and extreme storms have already cost billions of dollars. Globally, climate change has cost lives and human suffering. We are seeing climate refugees, destabilization and political unrest in the face of drought and food shortages in places around the globe. The unfortunate truth is that Canada is behind. We need all the momentum that the federal government can bring forward. In fact, the International 2017 Climate Change Performance Index puts Canada at number 55 of 61 countries globally. That is one place better than we scored in 2016. We have much more to do. And in fact, many local governments in Canada are already out the gate. For the last 20 years, a number of Canadian communities have signed up with a program called Partners for Climate Protection. They've declared targets. They've been working towards them. We have more than 300 of those communities in Canada. The question is, how do we ramp this up? Because remember, 50% of greenhouse gas emissions. That's the question we were addressing when we identified 18 specific federal policy asks and 24 provincial territorial asks that would leverage up this potential for climate action in our top asks report. We looked at five areas, capacity building, smart growth, local energy, buildings, and transportation. So, what's happened to those 18 federal asks in the year since we tabled our report? Uh, 
Well, we have a, uh, a composition for you. We looked at all of these asks through a three-part three part screen of commitment, funding, and implementation. And the result is 28% actioned, 22% in progress, and 50% awaiting action. Uh, you can have a little look here at the full list of the screen there. You can see that the greens are the ones action, the yellows are the ones in progress, and the runs that are red ones are the ones that are waiting action. And in more detail, in the 28% actioned, we have some good ones. The very first one was price on carbon, a tick mark. We've seen a commitment to low carbon communities, another tick mark. We've seen dollars for Partners for Climate Protection Program that I referenced earlier. Those are all in the area of capacity building. We've seen a national transportation strategy, and we've seen matching transit funds to local governments. In the in-progress column, we know that the building code is under development. This is a very, very important initiative, but it's not yet done. We know that there have been dollars allocated for renewable energy projects for Indigenous and remote communities, again, still to be implemented, and we know there is consultation on incentivizing retrofits. There's nine others, and like most report cards, we have a room for improvement section. This will include some of those asks that have yet to be actioned, and some of those that are still in progress. So let's start with number one, tightening uh, Canada's current targets. Canada's cur current targets are not science-based. They will not meet the global test of the Paris Agreement requirements. Uh, fortunately, the Paris Agreement offers some periods of ratcheting up. There will be a facilitative discussion starting globally in 2018 that will allow countries to have another look at their commitments and opportunity to ratchet up those commitments. Because remember, we're on track for three degrees of warming. The second ask, tie infrastructure funding to our climate goals. Guarantee that infrastructure dollars won't lock Canadians onto a high carbon path because infrastructure lasts for a long time. We're already spending uh, a huge amount of money. Let's make that money count. The next ask, provide communities with the data that they need. Many uh, local communities do not have the staff capacity and it's hard to take action when you don't know the source of your emissions. Uh, in British Columbia, for example, every community has that profile. It's provided by, by the provincial government there. We would like to see that same availability across the country. We would also like to see a, a baseline of natural capital. That is an emerging area. There is value in the natural capital we have in our communities as carbon sinks that needs to be calculated and protected. Our fourth room for improvement is energy democracy. This means enabling communities and indigenous peoples to own their own clean energy generation sources. That has been the secret to Germany's rapid take up on clean energy is uh, in community and individually owned power development. To illustrate, an average community's uh, spend in Canada is 3,000 to 4,000 per capita each year on energy. In the city of London, Ontario, that amounted to $1.6 billion every year. Of that $1.6 billion, 12% stays in the community. 12%. Uh, uh, we have a slide here of a very ambitious example of energy democracy in action in Nelson, British Columbia. They are in the midst of creating their very first community solar garden. Members of the community can purchase a panel in the community solar garden and that is their energy, their energy source. Nelson is helped by the fact that it owns its own power uh, generation facility. The reason that this is important is that 30 to 50 percent of a Canada of a community's greenhouse gas emissions come from buildings. It's a huge percentage. So uh, this is a really, really important thing to know about in terms of energy generation. Which leads me to my next slide, accelerate energy retrofits. The World Building Council has just uh, again this week made a statement that says that 
every single building on the planet needs to be net zero by 2050 if we are to have a hope of meeting our greenhouse gas targets of two degrees of warming every single building it then goes on to say that most retrofit programs have resulted in about one percent of buildings being retrofitted we have huge scope and huge need for action here on the deeper faster retrofits for the uh, huge number of buildings that we currently have it's fortunate that we have the work on the building code going forward for the buildings yet to be built but we have a lot to do to take care of those buildings that we already have so just to recap uh, the uh, the room for improvement that we've identified in ramping up low carbon communities next are five things scientific targets we'd like to see those targets also adopted by communities tying infrastructure dollars to climate action giving communities the data they need to take action promoting energy democracy and ramping up retrofits more deeply more quickly and much more rapidly and another look at the bottom line, 28% action, 22% in progress, 50% awaiting action. And finally, to power up climate action, ramp up carbon, low carbon communities. So thank you. I'm going to just turn to Karen Farbridge here for a couple of moments about our methodology. Thank you. So for each of the 18 recommendations, uh, we reviewed uh, uh, federal uh, websites, ministerial websites, press releases. Um, we also turned to some key documents like Budget 2017, and the Pan-Canadian Framework on a Clean Economy and Climate. Um, and we also turn to many of the national organizations that do a lot of work in this space, whether it's policy development or research or programs. And what we were looking for was evidence of a commitment, uh, evidence of funding, and evidence of execution. And certainly we looked to execution as really informing where we saw great progress, where we saw some commitment and some direction. That's where we identified that in the middle and where we couldn't find any evidence of any significant movement or confirmation that some of these uh, aspirations around achieving climate goals um, were going to be achieved. So um, a fairly simple approach in terms of looking at it, um, but lays the groundwork for us to continue to, to monitor progress over the years. Uh, good morning. I wanted to start by acknowledging that we are on the traditional territory of the Algonquin people and offer my respects to the elders and elected leadership. My name is Andrea Reimer. I'm a city councillor from the city of Vancouver in British Columbia, where I've been the lead councillor on the Greenest City Action Plan, as well as on our efforts to be a 100% renewable city. Where I'm also a director on our regional district, Metro Vancouver, where I'm vice chair of the Climate Action Committee and recently was named as the vice chair of the National Green Municipal fun. Uh, today, however, I am here as one of the advisors of the Top Ask for Climate report. So you've heard the methodology and the outcome of the report card. My hope today was to do a few things. Um, first off, to thank the federal government for the actions and commitments to action that they have made. After 10 years of inaction and at times hostility to action on climate from the previous government, it is a welcome change of direction and very encouraging to see the progress that has been made over this last year and a half, but much still remains to be done. And nowhere is that more evident than on the main streets of our cities and towns in Canada. As the ground level of government, local authorities have had no choice but to act. Environmental degradation is not a theoretical future for us, but a very real now. Canada's municipalities have to face the fires, they have to face the floods, the extreme heat, and the cold weather emergencies. And it's why it propels us to act and stop a change in climate, why cities are so much further ahead. And the lessons that we've learned in the years that we've been acting on climate, um, and by which we would judge the success of a national government, are a few. The first is that there are no junior partners. We may have different capacities uh, as governments, but they are not more or less valuable. For us as municipalities, we often have to work with smaller municipalities 
First Nations or others who may uh, have less population uh, and may not have the money, but they do have a traditional knowledge, a social license, and embody a moral imperative that is priceless. And I would suggest to the federal government that municipalities are, uh, in relation to the federal government, very similar. It's also very important that roles, rights, and responsibilities are clearly defined. A good partnership is like a good relationship. It's hard to develop one with someone who is not self-aware, and organizations, in my experience, work very similarly to that. We need some clarity about the roles and rights, but also about what each partnership in the pan-Canadian framework is responsible for, an accountability framework that allows us to hold the federal government and ourselves as municipalities to account. Uh, in that regard, scientific targets as soon as possible would make a big difference for Canada's municipalities and our work with the provinces. Finally, uh, we need the federal government to create the space, not the to-do list. As you all know, having the power to tell someone to do something is very different than actually getting them to do it. If you have children, um, this is a very simple lesson that you learn early on. Um, and it's similarly the same for um, our municipalities, that telling us what to do is not going to work nearly as well as giving us a framework and letting us find a way, just as we work our, with our local residents in a similar way. I want to close by thanking the federal government again and encourage them to continue to act in haste on climate. Across the country, our municipalities are at both the four the front line of the fight against climate change but also the front line of managing the staggering impacts of it and we need to see the urgency of our plight reflected in moving federal government plans to action thank you thank you are there any questions hi yeah so uh what's your assessment of the risk of completing the item that uh, still need to be completed or still in progress. How does your assessment of that risk change if the Americans pull out of Paris? Well, that's a good question. As we said in the remarks, we are on target right now with our current commitments for three degrees of warming. That includes the U.S. Uh, fortunately, in our neighbors to the south, we have many, many other orders of government that are committed to climate action. That includes a number of cities and a number of states. California, the eighth largest economy in the world, is certainly not stepping back. Uh, and so I think we'll continue to see determined leadership from the United States from suborders of government that will help. Uh, certainly there will be uh, enormous and an international pressure for the United States to get back into the agreement should they opt out. Uh, it does put them in the company of only two other countries in the world and I can't expect that that would be a, a very tenable place for very long. I think the bottom line is, as Christina uh, Figueri said, this is not the time to waver. The rest of the world will carry forward. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, could you explain a little bit um, when you when you ask for scientific greenhouse gas targets? Mm -hmm. uh, could you explain that a bit? Yes. Yeah, so, so you'll remember there's there's been a lot of dialogue about this. What percentage that we need to reduce by what year? depending on what particular base year. Um, and we started that discussion with Kyoto uh, way back when, six degrees below by, uh, by 2020. Well, we're certainly not on target for that. That was a scientific target. The ones that we have today don't translate to that, uh, and they need to be upticked to translate to that scientific consensus based on an allocation of a fair allocation globally. Uh, is the best way to consider doing that. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Canada ranks 55th of 61 countries. Uh, and uh, it has gone up that whole one space, uh, thanks to the government's really determined action. But there is a lot of uh, space to be made up. And there's a lot of scope in these local government support actions that we've identified as well. That's the good news. Okay, anyone else? All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate your coming out today. Thank you. No problem.